Hey, it's Oz from Board Game Co. and welcome to a video on five board game collecting tips I actually do follow this time. Now this video is a bit of a follow-up to my last video which was five collecting tips I don't follow, five pieces of advice regarding building a better board game collection that I don't follow. And that video was a little tongue-in-cheek because really it was about rules that I mostly followed but also let myself not follow and it was a little bit of half and half, but, but this time these are tips that I really do try to follow as much as possible. I'm sure there are exceptions as well, but really they're they're just good pieces of advice in terms of how to keep a a lean collection, of how to weed through all the uh, games out there and, and really just wind up with the collection that works for you. And the first of those, and this is something I've talked about in the past, but the first of those is realizing that time is the most limited commodity you have. From all the things, from all the impacts you have in gaming, from all the various things that can contribute to the, the games in your collection, the amount of games you have, which games you have, time is the most limited. And the reason I say that is because Space is always a factor, but space is something that can often be overcome. Money is a factor, but money changes. Sometimes you get a new job, you get a bonus, you get a, a stimulus check for COVID-19 or whatever. Different things can affect how much money comes and goes. And also over time, if you if slowly but surely put money into a collection, money adds up. But time is the one thing that there is a finite limit on how much time you have. Of course it can vary, it can ebb and flow a bit. But at the end of the day, assuming you're doing anything else in your life, if you have, whether it's family, whether it's kids, whether it's a job, whether it's uh, playing video games, whatever it is, there is still an ebb and flow, of course, but time is the most limited commodity you have. And realizing that, realizing that there's only so much time you spend playing board games, whatever that number is for you, maybe, maybe you play board games for, I don't know, eight hours a week, which would be pretty impressive, right? It's not bad. Eight hours a week isn't bad at all. But it's still eight hours a week, and how many games are you trying to fit into those eight hours? And so looking around at games like, for me at least, Arena the Contest, which is a game that, really this game could represent a lot of my gaming in and of itself. There's a lot of game in these boxes, and I have more on the way, and I want to play it more. But I, but I don't. But realizing that, realizing that there's a game here that I love, that I'm not playing as much as I would like to, and that there are so many other games in my collection that I'm not playing as much as I would like to, that helps me get rid of other games. It helps me decide to get rid of Ludus Magnus Studios Sin, Sin Tempora. It helps me decide to get rid of City of Kings, which sadly I got and I'm interested in it. I really, really am interested in it. But I have to make decisions based on the fact that time is a limited commodity, and assuming I want to play game whatever, in this case Arena the Contest, I'm going to have to get rid of others. And for me, this is particularly a problem with these long epic campaign games, but really it's a problem with anything. With limited time means you have to make decisions, and understanding that time is a limited commodity, whatever your bandwidth is for playing games, that often helps me decide to get rid of other games. It helps me realize that hard choices have to be made, and getting rid of games that I really, really, really want to play is still better than not playing games I really, 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 really love. And number two, reason number two, or tip number two, not reason, tip number two, don't give games a second chance. And, and this is the kind of thing that might get you pushed back, but do not give games a second chance. Do not, if I, I just recently decided to get rid of Unmatched and Fantastic Factories, both of which, Unmatched is a particularly well-rated game. Fantastic Factories is a game that I enjoyed, but didn't think was, you know, amazing. I thought it was good, a solid choice. And many would say, Play it again. Give it another shot. Play that game a second time because it's worth playing a second time. You never really know how good a game is until you give it another another play. Give it a shot. Give it a chance. See where it lies. And that's certainly something that would have affected games in my collection over time. Race for the Galaxy, which I think is commonly held up as one of these examples, but Race for the Galaxy is a game that often everyone says you need to give it a second try. And, and I played that back when I first got into gaming and I did give it a second try because people said you should give it a second try and sure enough it was a great game and it's a game that stuck around my collection for a good six, seven years after that because it was a good game and it, it earned its spot and it, I never would have had it for that long if I hadn't played it a second time. So, so why would I advocate not to play games a second time? Why would I advocate not to give games a second chance? Because again, time is a limited commodity. Why, Fantastic, let's, say, let's not use Fantastic Factories, I actually like that one a little more. But Unmatched is a, p potentially a great game, potentially a game that would shine on its second playthrough. But if I didn't like it, if I didn't see enough reason to play it a second time, I can choose between playing Unmatched 
or a game I know I love. Meaning, when you choose not to give a game a second chance, when you choose to say, you know what, I played it, it's not for me, it's not that you're saying I am 100% right. I am definitely 100% certain that that game is not for me. That's not what you're doing. What you're doing instead is you're saying is I have limited time to play games and so I would rather play another game that I know I like or another game that I want to play that's on my radar and I want to give it a shot. And I'd rather do that than see whether Unmatched might be a better game. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush and as much as, the, as, much as I will 100% recognize that playing games a second chance will often unlock opportunities or will unlock seeing the promise or the light of a game that you didn't otherwise see. That will happen every time I trade away a game after playing it once, after playing it twice, and I don't give it more chances, I understand and recognize that there is a chance that I'm giving something up that might be a great fit for my collection. But it's either that or play a game I already know I like, and I know which one I'm going to choose given that set of choices. Now I will say it as an exception, this doesn't mean don't play a game a second chance if you want to. Everdell is one of my favorite games of all time. Bruges is one of my favorite games of all time. Istanbul is, well, it's a really, really good game that I really enjoy for the right crowd, but I can't say it's one of my favorite games of all time, but I really do like it. These are all games that I played once, got rid of, and then over time I decided I was interested in them and I got them back. Now that's, that's a very different thing that I'm saying. I'm saying that Play a game a second time if you want to. That's a whole different conversation. If you, if something about the game is pulling you back, if you're kind of thinking about it and you're saying, you know what, there's a reason I, I, I want to play that game, there's a reason I want to give it a shot, well, then do so by all means. I'm just saying that if you don't feel that pull, if you're not feeling that, that something, that promise that, that calls you back to the table, don't force it. Don't push it. There are plenty of other games that will beckon because you either like them already or something new and shiny about them and you want to see if that newest game by this designer or that company or just something that looks pretty is really a right fit for you. So don't give games a second chance. I just don't think it's worth it. I don't think it's worth doing assuming you have other games calling for your attention. If you have a smaller collection, if you have more time and you don't, you're not yet at that point where these, these, all these games are calling for our attention, then sure. By all means, play a game a second chance, give it an opportunity, but don't, don't force it. There are many other better things to do with your time. And number three, tip number three is ratings are just advice. At the end of the day, a rating is not any sort of hardcore metric of whether you should or shouldn't like a game. It's really just a piece of advice. So whenever you have a board, let's use Board Game Geek, uh, the biggest, you know, I guess, source of ratings of board games out there. But when you go on Board Game Geek, Geek, Geek and you see something is an 8.9, you see something in the top 100, or maybe it's a 6.4, that's just advice. It's not a fixed, ac ac accurate answer of what that game is to you. Because, for instance, Voyages of Marco Polo, which is a game in the top 100, this is a game that, while I'm sort of interested in, in the premise, and I do want to get Marco Polo too. Ultimately, this is a game that I chose to get rid of because the rating is just advice. It doesn't mean I will like the game, but yes, it certainly put it on my radar. It certainly is something that said, you know what, there's something about this game. People are interested in it. People are pulled in by this game. Maybe I should look as well. Ratings are definitely advice. And then the flip side of that is you have something like Besieged, which is, I think it's like a 6.7 on Board Game Geek or something, but this is a game I enjoy. I really like playing Besieged. I like pulling it out. It's a, it provides a good tower defense experience that, for me, while it's not, you know, a top 10 for me or anything like that, it is significantly higher in my own collection than the ratings would indicate. And I have other games like that. I have Terra Nova as well, which also fits into that category. Ratings do not define whether you should or shouldn't like a game. They only define some framework of reference as to whether you should get the game. It's a piece of advice that the, the internets have bestowed upon you, and just like anything, other, just like any other piece of advice, you should take that along with everything else. The reason I've played Besieged is because I had a friend recommend it to me and said, no, it's better than the ratings. And so I took a look, and it's better than the ratings, at least for me. Similarly, Terra Nova, I gave a shot because I got that back when I didn't really pay ratings that much attention, and so I got it and gave it a shot, and it's still stayed in my collection ever since. Ratings are advice, just like anything else. Find any number of sources that work for you to give you that advice, whether it's whether it's geek buddies who you trust their ratings, whether it's reviewers whose tastes al align with your own. If someone who if someone else out there, whether it's a friend, reviewer, geek buddy, whatever, can also provide advice, well then take that into account along with ratings. Ratings don't mean a game is bad, and ratings don't mean you should like a game. 
It just is a piece of advice. And tip number four is turn unplayed games into new games. In terms of keeping a leaner collection, in terms of in terms of making everything work for your collection, find a way to turn unplayed games into something new. And this is this is obviously a shill to a degree because I do run Board Game Co. and we buy and sell used games, we trade used games, and so I can both take advantage of the service myself as well as I'm obviously interested in sending all of you towards that. So take this with a grain of salt or whatnot. But even if you don't use Board Game Co., even if you just hop on Board Game Geek and trade games with other people, the idea that a game once acquired is locked and set and now it basically represents a, a sunk cost and it's, if you don't like that game, it's gone. Let's use Marco Polo again. If, as soon as I don't like Marco Polo, what do I do with it? Is this a glorified paperwork? Does it sit on my shelf unplayed? Do I donate it to Goodwill? What do I do with a game that isn't being played and and you need to find a way to monetize that you need to find a way to turn anything you're not playing into another game you will play whether you do it because you are super efficient and you manage to buy this for fifty dollars and turn around and get forty five dollars back that's great that's excellent or even if you just turn around and find the fastest person who'll take it off your hands for twenty bucks because you just want to make it move and turn it into something because otherwise it's just space on your shelf well that works too but find a way to turn your unplayed games into new games because the longer you are in this hobby, the longer you are playing games and the longer you pick up games that just aren't a fit for your collection, the more you will have these sitting up and the more of a sunk cost they will represent. If you can find a way to cycle your collection, then you can do what I effectively do all the time, which is I get as many games as I can and then I play them and if they're not for me, I just move on. And I've gotten rid of games and I get them back for that same reason because if you find a way to sell your games, if you find a way to trade your games, if you have an engine, th think of it as a game. It's just one more game that we're trying to, to work on. How many games can you actually play and what do you do with the games? And if you sell them fast enough, you get extra victory points and we all want victory points. But find a way to turn your unplayed games into new games. It will help you it will help you get your hands more on the games you want. It will help you, you know, jump into games with less of a of an aspect. I mean, how often do you feel the need to watch 14 hours of reviews before you get a game? How often do you need, you know, if you find out about whatever Istanbul or whatnot, do you do you watch three different reviews? Do you then read the rule book? Your time is also, like I said, your time is a limited commodity. If you spend all your time researching a game because you have to, you have to understand that if you don't get that, if you don't like that game, it's gone, it's over, it's a sunk cost. Well, that you're giving up your time on the front end. For me, I tend to look into a game with like one review, throw it up in the background, and see if it's an interest to me just with that. And then once I get it, it either is or isn't a fit, and it moves on. It goes to the trade pile if it's not right for me. Find a way to turn your unplayed games into new games, whether it's through selling, trading, or, I mean, I don't know if there's another option. I think selling and trading is pretty much it, unless you can figure out a way to literally turn it into a new game. But that's basically it. Sell or trade your games. Do it. It's worth it. And number five, tip number five, and this is something I talked about in the past as well, is keep a list. A list is super important, both for the games you want to get, as well as, more importantly, for the games you don't actually really want to get but you're kind of on the fence about and this is good for both games that you have in your collection right now that you kind of really should be getting rid of but it's also good for games that aren't in your collection and you're thinking about getting them and they're on your radar and you just don't need it right now because right now you know that you have 40 unplayed games on your shelf or or you're just not really interested in play getting new that, that not not that not that you're not interested but you either have too many unplayed games or alternatively you just don't need more games right now, but if you you need to find a way to put your games on a list so that when something is on your radar, it doesn't actually need to enter your collection right away. So in my case, for instance, Mombasa, and these are games I talked about in the past. Mombasa and Robinson Crusoe, I am finally getting rid of, but I still really want to play them, and I still really want to give it a shot, but I just... I have too many other games that are going to hit the table first and I don't know when these guys will hit the table. I don't. I just don't know when it will happen. I'm, hopefully it will happen at some point, but I can't tell you when that will be. But in order to get rid of them, the first thing I did is I sat there and said, these are going on my wishlist again. I'm putting these back on my list. It doesn't mean I have to get them. Not at all. I may never get them again. I may sit there and just put it on the list and never get it and that's okay. Because effectively what we're doing here is we're lying to ourselves, and lying to ourselves works. If you find a game that is on your radar, if you, whatever new game, I don't know, I'm trying to think what, let's say, uh, um, Alma Mater, Alma Mater, which is a sequel to Coimbra, which Tom Vassell gave the okay review to. I still really want to get it because it's the sequel to Coimbra, and I, I really like Coimbra quite a bit, and... 
I should get it. But I also know that I have a lot of other games that are good and a game that is being, I guess, rated by, by one person, just by one person, is not necessarily as good. I'll put it on a list. Maybe I'll get it eventually. Maybe I'll get it when it's on sale. Maybe I won't get it at all. But putting games on a list gives you that window to take a game off your mental energy. It takes your focus away from the game. Everyone wants something that's new and hot. I feel, I feel like games should often, just like guns, we should have like a, a wait list where when you want a game, you have to wait at least a week before you can even buy it because generally in a week you'll, you'll calm down. Whatever it is about the game, you'll be more rational about it. It's no longer going to be that newest shiny that was on sale on Amazon for $35 and I absolutely have to get it. Or look at this, it's from a designer I like or a publisher I like and really I just want more games. Have a list and put your games on that list and get them when you really are ready to play them. Don't feel the need to get them now. You're overpaying if you do. If you try to get a game as soon as it catches your attention, ultimately, on average, you're going to be overpaying, whether it's because it's hot and new or whether it's because you're not waiting for the right time or whatnot. And if you think you're playing that game tomorrow, by all means, get it. That's a different conversation entirely. But if you're just getting a game so it can join the other unplayed games on your shelf, you can put it on a list with the other unplayed games on the list and you'll save yourself a lot of money. Try to have a list. It will really help you make mostly conservative decisions. Sadly, I will say, those lists don't help as much as I would like when it comes to Kickstarter because of the nature of the FOMO aspect of it and the potential, will it be cheaper later or not? And that's basically it. Those are my five tips or five of many tips, I'm sure, that I do actively follow. I do track these a lot, which is, again, to quick recap, time is a limited commodity. And it's the most limited commodity you have. We can lie to ourselves about how much money we have. We can use credit cards, sadly, to help us with that. We can lie to ourselves about how much space we can have or we can just make space. But you can't lie about how much time you have. It is a limited commodity that you can't there's only so far you can expand it and it, it comes by giving up other things or eventually you still hit a cap. There's only 24 hours in a day. Number two is don't give games a second chance. It's not worth it. And again, I understand if you want to, do so. That's not telling you not to play a game again if you're on the fence or whatever and you want to play it. But if you played a game and it wasn't for you, don't feel the need to play it again. There are other games you like already. And there's other games in your shelf that are begging for your attention. You don't need to play a game a second time. And it's okay if you're missing out on something, that's fine, it will happen. Number three is ratings are just advice. They are a guideline, they're a gatekeeper, they give us a filter and a funnel to acquire games, but they don't define whether we should like them, and they don't define whether we shouldn't like them. If you like a game, that's great, and if you don't like a game, that's okay too. Nobody needs to convince you otherwise. Number four is turn unplayed games into new games. Find a way to cycle your collection. Find a way to, to not be tethered to every single game you have played, and well, if you're not gonna play it, I mean, if you're not gonna sell it, I mean, you may as well play it, right? Because it's on your shelf, and is taking up space and you don't have a way to sell or trade it. No, sell or trade it. Find a way to make that work. And number five is keep a list. Keep a list of the games you want. Keep a list of the games you get rid of that you, you're sure you want to play again because just having a place to put that game gives us the opportunity to say, no, 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 we're, we're, we're on it. We're not saying no, we're just saying later. And that, that lie is helpful and it gives us our out that we really need. And those, again, are my five board game tips, or five of my board game tips, collection tips that I actually follow, and hopefully they're helpful to you as well. Until next time, I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you found this video useful. If you have, by all means, subscribe down below, leave a comment, tell me what your tips are, tell me what you do for your collection, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, and which of these games that I am or am not getting rid of or whatever, what do you, what do you think? Just let me know in the comments down below. I'm always interested in the conversation, and that's basically it. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co., and have a good one.